Today, we're going to look inside a homebrew power supply. One that takes 240 volts input and gives you two voltages. 12 volts at around two amps, and 34 volts, again, at around two to three amps. A power supply like this could be useful for powering QRP gear on the 12 volt terminals. But not only that, but also gear with amplifiers that give around 25 to 40 watts output using, say, IRF 510s. They typically need a bit higher voltage, like around 30 to 40 volts. The purpose of this video is not so much to tell you how to build one of these, but to pick holes in it and see if it can be built any better. It's particularly important given it's a 240 volt operated supply. So safety is much more of a consideration than if you're just building 12 volt gear. As for whether you should build this sort of stuff yourself, that depends on your experience, expertise, and even your country's regulations in relation to constructing things that plug into the wall. Anyway, we'll lift the lid and see what's inside. We'll just describe the insides of the supply first. One of the power transformers, around 18 volts AC output, that is for the 12 volt section, and there's the bridge rectifier, regulator, heat sink, and the output for the 12 volt section. Here's the bigger transformer, the secondary is 24 volts, bridge rectifier, electrolytic capacitors, this is unregulated and the output goes straight to the output terminals here for the 34 volt. The mains lead comes in just here, a fuse, a power switch and really not much to it apart from that. We'll now go into a bit more detail. We'll first of all look at the mains cord entry. The important thing is that the cord has a degree of anchorage so that if the rig was to be pulled off the desk or the cable pulled then the connections don't fall apart inside. Some equipment used a rubber grommet like this which isn't really recommended as it doesn't give you proper cord anchorage. More recently is something like this. This actually grips onto the cord. You drill a hole in the back panel of the supply you put it in and it all holds together. Cord anchorage is provided because of the pressure between the mounting hole onto the cord. These are the power connectors at the back. Now there's a few problems. First of all, they're not polarized, so there's a risk that you could connect the red wire to this and the black wire to this and reverse polarity, potentially damaging the item. The other thing is that the same type of connectors are used for the 12 volt section and also for the 34 volt section. And if you were to connect the 12 volt appliance to these terminals, then you'll almost certainly blow it up. So that's something to bear in mind. We'll be very careful. An important thing with a fuse holder is because it is at mains voltage, you don't want the situation where you could be touching and be in contact with mains voltage if you were to, or someone was to inadvertently take off the fuse holder. You can overcome that with some careful wiring. What you want is for the contact on the fuse holder that's right at the back to be the one that's connected to the active of the incoming mains cable. And for the transformer to be connected to the front connector, i.e. the one that you'd be in contact if you were to stick your finger into. Note that the fuse must be in the active line. It's the first part of the power supply that the mains cord comes into contact with even before the power switch. The wire here is colour coded and you need to know which is active neutral and earth and to double check that it is the case against the pins of the plug for your country. Another thing you need to be very careful of is which part of it is at mains voltage and to ensure there's nothing that you can touch and be in contact with even if you were to probe around with your finger with the lid off which is foolish anyway but you should at least do these double steps to reduce the risk of any problems. Ideally you'd be using heat shrink tubing. Here use has been made of insulated wire. Probably if you have some super glue on here to ensure that it's properly glued in position that might help as well. All the parts of this supply at 240 volt potential is the fuse, the main switch and the connections to the primaries of both transformers. 
this is where the mains power cord comes in. Now, one thing you do need to be aware of is you need a bit more slack on the earth wire than on the active and the neutral wires. The purpose of that is even if despite your best attempts at cord anchorage, the cord was to pull out, then the earth wire would be the last one to lose contact. That assures a little bit of extra safety. Here's the on off switch for the supply. It's on the primary or the 240 volt side of both transformers. Between the transformers, the fuse and the power cable. Note there's only two wires going to it. That's a single pole, single throw switch. In this case, it's wired in the active line. Now that's not ideal, because there can be power points or even extension cords where active and neutral is transposed. It's safer to switch both active and neutral. And you can do that by wiring a double pole, double throw switch instead of the one installed here. It's possibly a bit hard to see in the picture, but the screws here are self-tapping screws. There's no nuts to hold it. In fact, the front of these screws is quite sharp. It's important to ensure that no matter what you're doing, there's no possibility that these screws could pierce any wire, particularly one carrying high voltage and current. This wire, which carries mains, is a bit loose and sloppy, and you should really use a cable tie to bind them together to ensure they don't slop around and could cause short circuits. It's important to mount transformers correctly, so they don't shake loose when you move the supply. Use thick stout screws and appropriate washers. Heat sinks need to be sufficient and there needs to be grease to ensure reasonable transfer between the power transistor or regulator and the heat sink. Otherwise, the heat sink won't be doing its job. Internal wiring needs to be short and thick enough to handle the current asked of it, so there's a minimum of voltage drop. Here's the 12 volt output. Two wires going to the 12 volt output terminals. There is some protection provided by this clear vinyl sheath. However, you'll notice it's resting against the heat sink. Now, although there's a reasonably generous heat sink, given the small amount of power that this is for, only about one or two amps, it still poses a risk if this heatsink was to overheat and melt into the wire. For that reason, you need the wire to be away from the heatsink and not leaning against it. If I made the wire a little bit shorter, that would have made the supply a lot safer. But you don't want it so short as to be tight and put stress on connections. Any metal used in a power supply, especially if there are corners like this, should be filed so they're rounded then there's a lesser chance of them piercing into wires. The outside corners of the case should likewise be filed, so they don't cause injury if you try to carry it. You'll notice the output from each of these supplies goes straight to the output terminals. There's no fuse, but if you want extra protection, you should put a fuse in line with the positive connections. Choose a current rating that's a bit higher than what you'd expect to draw from the supply. Here's the 34 volt section of the supply. Very simple, just a bridge rectifier and electrolytic capacitors. You might need to put a heat sink on the bridge rectifier if you're drawing more than an amp or so. Another thing to consider is that this is the DC output, 34 volts at about two amps. It's only a millimeter or so away from the chassis, which is earthed. If there is say a speck of wire or solder, then there would be a short circuit. It may be better construction technique to have greater separation between the 34 volt DC output of this supply and the chassis, which is earthed. Some anchorage for the wires that come out of this transformer probably also wouldn't go astray. This is the underside of the lid. Note, no ventilation holes. Power supplies generate heat and heat needs somewhere to go. Otherwise, heat confined in a box can make an electrical item less reliable. This case has a few extra holes because it was used for a previous electrical project. Unfortunately, some of them are so wide that they fit my little finger. That's undesirable. Ventilation slots should be a lot narrower than that. And even if your finger can't fit through, there may be others in the house with prying hands who may be endangered by a supply like this.
I haven't spoken much about the electrical design of the circuitry, but it almost goes without saying that your components should be rated conservatively relative to the current that you expect to draw from the output terminals. If you try and carry the supply by the handles, which invite you to carry it by it, then I don't feel all that comfortable because of the stress placed on the bottom. Instead, it's better to carry the supply like this, so that the weight is better distributed and your hands are under the heavy transformers. These are just a few random observations on building a power supply. Just a reminder that building things that use mains electricity can be lethal, especially if done by a person who's careless or lacks the appropriate skill. Luckily, in amateur radio, you can get by and not have to touch a mains item at all, even if you do build a lot of equipment. However, if you do want to experiment with equipment that uses higher power levels, then almost certainly you will be building something that either plugs into the mains or uses high voltages. And for that, it pays to be prepared with the appropriate knowledge so you can build equipment that's safe for you and others to use.